via Microsoft Azure Global Black Belt for Open Source Solutions, right? So, uh, and, and, and Steve, of course, is the uh, Chief Evangelist for Azure Government. So uh, please welcome them to the stage, and I'm uh, really happy to have you guys. Okay, thanks for having us here today. I'm Steve McLaughlin, as he said, I'm on the uh, Azure Government Engineering Team. My colleague uh, my Eddie. My name is Eddie Vialba, uh, Azure, fancy word for a cloud architect, uh, working with our engineering team and our field sales engineer, uh, called me Global Black Belt, uh, covering open source solutions, but more importantly, uh, all of our container technologies that we run in Azure Cloud. So what we're gonna talk to you about today is running Docker on Azure Government. And the way we're gonna start out is I'm gonna give you about five minutes just to give you a background on Azure Government itself. And then Eddie's gonna come in and show numerous demos of Docker, specifically running on Azure. All right. So the most important thing is Hold that on. anytime I get up, let's see and my slide advance works. The slide here. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah. Going. So anytime I get up and talk to anyone about Azure Government, really the most important thing is that the first question we have to answer is, well, what is Azure Government? Okay, it's really important to have that first. So at a high level, what I would say is Azure Government is its own sovereign cloud. Well, what does that mean, sovereign cloud? We're talking about it's its own distinct instance of Azure. It's not connected to our commercial version of Azure at all. It's a distinct instance of Azure. This means it has its own isolated data centers, its own isolated network. It's isolated to only government workloads. And we say government, yes, we mean federal, but we also mean state and local, fed, civ. So it's its own dedicated instance of Azure. And these data centers are uh, staffed by only screened US persons, which is what enables us to have a higher level of compliance compared to, for example, our, our commercial cloud. And because these uh, have isolated data centers, we have uh, you know, data sovereignty, all the data stays within the continental United States, but it's running Azure in multiple data centers, so we have a uh, hyperscale cloud. So you heard me mention a couple times the data centers that we have. And if you look at this diagram here, you actually see six different data centers. No, this is actually six times more data centers than our closest competitor in the government space. And we started out with our two existing regions in Virginia and Iowa. That's what we had all ever since the beginning of Azure Gov. A few months ago, we added two additional data centers geographically located in similar regions. That's why you see those, those blue dots is kind of on top of each other in, in Virginia and Iowa. These two new data centers that we had a few months ago are different because these are what we call our DOD data centers. They have a higher level of compliance. They have DISA level five, which no other uh, government cloud has um, from a commercial vendor like Microsoft. And DISA level five is the highest level of compliance you can get for unclassified workloads. So we think that's a really big deal uh, for these DOD data centers uh, dedicated to DOD workloads. And then you see the fifth and sixth data center kind of south central and, and located in the west of the United States. And these are coming online as we speak in the next month or two. So this will bring our total data centers to, to six. And not only do we have six data centers, which is six times more than our closest competitor, but also these data centers are located 500 miles at least away from each other. That 500 miles is a very important metric because when you think about a horrible event happening like a terrible a natural disaster or, or a terrorist attack, if some catastrophic, catastrophic event were to happen, you can rest uh, easier at night knowing you have some geo-redundancy built in. Uh, we have geo-redundancy in many of our services. Have you architected your solution in a geo-redundant fashion such that if something happens catastrophic at one data center, you've still got another data center backing that up? That's a hugely important thing. Now, in addition to our data centers, we also have six express route locations. Express route is the technology that enables you to securely connect your on-prem data center to our cloud. You can connect via express route without going over the public internet. And not only that, but our express route locations, unlike some of our competitors, do not piggyback on any of our infrastructure from our commercial cloud. It's dedicated to government. So we have our own fiber, and these express route locations are what enable you to securely connect. So they open up these hybrid scenarios. For example, let's say you wanna, I wanna put all my web apps in the cloud, but my database, I'm not ready to do that yet. I wanna keep that in my on-prem data center. Express route is the technology you can, you can uh, use to pull some of those scenarios off in a uh, high-speed uh, private connection between your cloud and your on-prem data center. 
Now, you heard me mention uh, certifications earlier, and these are certifications from Azure Worldwide. But this row right here is the one we really care about because this is the United States. And you heard me mention DISA level, uh, DISA level 5, DISA level 4. We have CGIS, uh, FedRAMP, and so numerous uh, certifications on the government platform. In addition to that, uh, if you are in state and local government, uh, you probably care about CGIS certifications. We now have CGIS agreements with 28 states. Those 28 states cover over 70% of the population in the United States, and this number just keeps on growing. So if you hear me talk about Azure government a month from now or two months from now, uh, <laughs> that number is going to be higher than 28. It's everything so, with Azure. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so not only CGIS, but we also talk about FedRAMP. We have 32 uh, services currently in scope. We had FedRAMP moderate in June of 2015, now have FedRAMP high June of 2016. Uh, and as I said, 32 services covered under FedRAMP, which is a significantly higher number than other cloud providers. So I think that's important because you can't just say, oh, you know, we have FedRAMP if a cloud provider says that. Well, what has FedRAMP? Which services have FedRAMP? And for Azure government, we specifically have 32 that are currently in FedRAMP. Again, talking about certification, anyone that has had to get their app certified knows that this can be a, a mind-numbing process going through these certification documents. And just because you deploy to Azure government doesn't mean your app is automatically compliant. Yes, you are deploying on a compliant infrastructure, but you also have developer responsibility to make sure your app is compliant. The Azure Blueprint is your tool that it hugely streams, streamlines this process. And we have different versions of the Blueprint depending on whether you care about FedRAMP or DISA, DISA Level 4, DISA Level 5. And you know, as a developer, I can tell you that you want that process streamlined as much as humanly possible. These are the things we take care of you for you as Microsoft, and here are the things that, yes, as developer responsibility, you need to make sure you're doing. That Azure Blueprint will help you considerably speed up your certification process for your app. Okay, so this is the main things I want to talk about. We have a huge number of releases that have happened in the last three months. And this is important because if you looked at Azure government maybe a year ago, maybe you, there was a possibility you were slightly underwhelmed. <laughs> but the way the landscape has changed uh, in the last year with Azure government, uh, we have significant parity in, com in uh, comparison now to our commercial cloud, and that just keeps going up. Uh, so that's my quick little introduction to Azure government, and now I'm going to turn it over to Eddie for a series of uh, demos. Awesome. Yeah. So I, I do have a, a few slides. Uh, I, don't, I, I promise you I'm going to try to make them as fast as possible and get into the meat and potatoes. But uh, what I wanted to make sure that, that we got away from this uh, conversation with you guys is that we're taking containers very seriously. Uh, we understand containers are everywhere. They're um, they're not only being used for dev, but we're seeing our customers uh, and our partners use them in production scenarios. And Microsoft is dedicated to making sure that we can uh, commit to you a product lifecycle and a product set um, in our cloud platform, and not just our cloud platform, but also our hybrid cloud platform, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, to be able to deliver those kind of workloads. No matter which vendor you choose or no matter which technology you use, we want Microsoft Cloud to be the first cloud you look at when you deploy those. Um, so we, we take this um, container very seriously, and I'll talk about a couple of different services that we're looking at and we're, we're um, developing, but um, our goal really is to take this Gartner, this Gartner kind of study they did, they call it the hype cycle of innovation. And where they believe today where, where containerization is, is in this great little um, peak of inflated expectations. Everyone, every CIO, every CTO has on their table, on their desk somewhere, something about, I need to containerize everything. And we think it's the right move, and everyone thinks it's the right move, and the industry is leading towards it. But what we want to do is make it easier so that we get out of this um, trough of disillusionment phase, which should come next. And we don't want, and Docker and Microsoft are all working very hard so that we can make these technologies easier for you to implement, easier for you to deploy very quickly, and more importantly, easier for you to get your solutions to market um, as fast as possible and get you over that, that trough and bring you to this scope of enlightenment. So how do we do that? We do that by partnering with Docker, um, partnering with uh, organizations and partners that can come together and truly, op with openness, put together a platform that we can deliver these solutions on in a very rapid scale. Um, so we talk about things like this uh, Docker, uh, Docker Data Center, Docker Enterprise, and we'll talk about something called an Azure Marketplace. I'm going to show you that in a minute. 
but being able to quickly go into a marketplace solution, find a template for what you need, answer a few questions, and in 20, less than 20 minutes, you have an entire compliant Docker swarm ready to go for you to start deploying on and creating your solutions on. Um, and you know, we, it's not just being able to do IaaS and put your workloads in Azure and say I've got a bunch of VMs with running Docker Swarm, but it's also giving you that full pipeline, being able to give you solutions that give you this build, ship, run type scenario, but being able to use a mix of technologies that you can run in either Microsoft Cloud, on-premise with Microsoft products, or with third-party products. But more importantly, the cloud is your, is your delivery arm for these services, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, this slide, as you can see, um, this is the Docker platform, but more importantly, down at the bottom, we want to be that player that you look for, for um, your trusted cloud provider, but as you'll find out coming uh, in a release that's coming out towards the end of the year, and, and our partners at HPE are one of our premier partners in this new, uh, new adventure that we have called Azure Stack which is taking the Azure platform and all of the APIs and all of the goodness that is this modern cloud and bringing it to you onto on-premises so you can deploy on-premises. But more importantly, having a very unified interface and a unified API model so that if I write a JSON file template to deploy a Docker Swarm on-premises, that can use that same exact template to deploy that Swarm in my, cloud, my public cloud and vice versa. Um, so being able to take that and have a true unified platform instead of like what other competitors are doing where they can say we're going we're gonna to do some API calls and you're going to be able to do it, but now you have two different panes of glass, you have two different interfaces. So when we look at this larger platform, this Docker platform sits on top of that Azure or Azure Stack infrastructure that we can provide for you and then true have, a, have a true hybrid cloud scenario um, for your container ecosystem. And then... We, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we made, uh, during the initial stages of our Windows Server um, 2016 de point, uh, development stages, we knew that containerization was going to be very important. Um, as so for, the, for those of you who are really technically minded, you know how containers really work. It's working with C groups uh, in Linux. Well, there's no C groups in Windows if you know the Windows kernel, right? This doesn't exist. Um, so how do we do it? Uh, so we actually had to rewrite and add another layer into above the kernel to basically do these, these services that allow to mimic the same thing as these C groups and namespaces that you have in the Linux world to be able to give you that same capability of having operating system virtualization, but now at the Windows layer. So now we have Windows Server Container that shipped in Windows Server 2016. Um, so you have uh, the capability of, of uh, putting in the Windows infrastructure and then also layering containers. And the beauty is it's no, it's no different than Linux containers. So the same API and the same command CLI will work on a Windows machine versus uh, a Linux machine, right? And I'm going to show you a little bit of picture in a minute on um, how that actually happened. Um, but we introduced something even more um, important for us, and this, this becomes very important in a second, uh, of something that we just announced at DockerCon two weeks ago, is we enable something called Hyper-V containers. So this is leveraging our technology of hypervisor isolation and layering it with containers and being able to do isolated containerization. So now I can have containers running completely isolated at the kernel level from each other. And then what we announced two weeks ago, not, this won't only give you the isolation and performance that you're looking for for containers on Windows, but we just open source the capability, and we're going to be releasing very soon, the, be, the capability to bring your own Linux, and Linux Kit will be one of the first Linux that we'll be offering there, to be able to run Linux containers and Windows containers side by side on the same host, isolated from each other. So now you can have a complete infrastructure, and your workloads, it doesn't matter if they're Linux workloads or Windows workloads, we can containerize them all. Right? And those are the kind of innovations that we're trying to bring to the table. Um, so it sounds like if I hearing this correct, is we can do containers on Windows, yep. or Linux, or this model with Hyper-V. Or both, exactly. So uh, I can take, uh, and I'll show you a container that's built for Linux, and running our .NET Core, and you can take that .NET Core and then convert it to a Windows uh, image, and you can run it on a Windows VM, um, or you can just keep it Linux. Or you can have a hybrid cluster, and you can have uh, another announcement that we made at DockerCon, is the ability to do network overlay for Windows Server 
uh, and Linux servers on the same swarm in swarm mode. So now I can have a hybrid cluster. I can actually have Linux, Linux VMs running in my swarm. I can have Windows VMs running in my swarm. I can use labels um, to go ahead and do placement constraints and say, I want this service because it's written in .NET and I want to put it in a Windows server. And then these, uh, I want a Redis or a PostgreSQL and I want to, I want to run it on a Linux server. And the services will talk to each other because they're on the same network, right? Um, so very seamless. And, and the way we did that was basically, as I said earlier, we took that concept of control groups, namespaces, and layering capabilities native to Linux, and we built this compute services model above uh, in the kernel for Windows Server 2016 that gives us that same capability so we didn't have to change Docker's API, all their interfaces, uh, to be able to, uh, to talk to us that way. So with that, let's get to actual showing you what that looks like. Uh, so let's, um, I'm going to go ahead and minimize that. And I'm going to. So if there's if there's no other takeaway, it's that if you want to run Docker in Azure, you do not have to run it on Windows. And I know that's repeating what was just said, but I think it's important <laughs> because I'm, I can't tell you how many times I hear people, oh, I want to run Docker. Yeah, I've got to have Windows though, right? No. If you want to deploy your Docker workloads on Azure, you absolutely can run those on Linux with no Windows involvement whatsoever. The choice is completely yours. Absolutely. So um, I'm in my Azure government portal, if you can see it. Um, and I basically created a, a resource group that I deployed from the Mar Azure marketplace, our Docker enterprise image. So it's just a JSON template that you can edit yourself if you want to. Uh, after you go through the wizard, it actually gives the option to download the template. And you can actually view the, pu this, the pure JSON. And you can edit some of them uh, depending upon what you're, you're trying to, to, uh, to do and modify. But what you'll notice is basically I have a bunch of storage, I have a bunch of compute, and for some reason my scroll is not working, if I can find it. Uh, let me see if I, can get it, if I can get over there. There we go, okay. So I have a bunch of compute, uh, storage, I have a network, uh, and in these down here, VMSS and uh, manager VMSS and worker VMSS, this is what we call our virtual machine scale sets. Uh, so this is our ability to uh, truly take compute as uh, cattle instead of pets, and we just treat a bunch of VMs as one uh, container or one object, and we can expand and auto scale those, uh, those VMs on a regular basis. So that's my, that's my swarm. So let me show you what that looks like. So basically I can uh, SSH into, and yes, I am running on Windows uh, 10, and uh, yes, there is the Bash shell in Windows 10, by the way. So you can enable Bash shell in Windows 10, and it works just like the Bash shell. But the VMs you spun up there, those are Linux VMs or Windows VMs? These are all Linux VMs. Okay. So I'm SSH'd into my Swarm Master right now, so I'm gonna go ahead and just do a Docker node LS. So there's my three nodes, uh, there's my manager, and basically I just have uh, a very small cluster. I can make, I can have uh, one, three, or five, or multiples, uh, odd multiples of managers, and I can have as many agents as I need up to, a VM scale set supports up to uh, 100 VMs in a single scale set. Um, so I can have multiple VMs in there if I wanted to for agents. Uh, so basically there's my, there's my, my nodes um, that I have. So now what I wanna show you is how I would work on a daily basis, right? Um, I have installed on my laptop, I also have Docker, um, Docker for Windows. Docker for Windows, um, if I can switch back to just my, my laptop here. Let's see if I can, okay, you guys see that? All right. So I have Docker for Windows. This is, the, um, this is what they call the edge release. And then what they've enabled now is for me not to just have Docker for Windows, because this is running on a Windows machine. So I can, I can develop for Linux. I can also develop for Windows by just pressing a switch of a command. So uh, if I go again uh, here, you see where I have this option that says switch to Windows containers. So I can now develop for Windows containers and Linux containers on the same box without having to move around. Also in this edge channel release, this is something new, with one Docker Cloud ID, so I'm using my Docker Cloud ID, I signed in using my Windows for Docker uh, client, but I can also see my swarms now. So now I have this swarm registered to my Docker Cloud ID, and I can go ahead and I can click into this swarm mode, and I open up a local console where now I have the same access to my swarm. And I can, begin man I can begin developing both on my local machine, and then when I'm ready, deploy to my swarm if I need to, very quickly and very easily. All within the Windows landscape, never left Windows. 
So let's say I'm developing, I'm using Visual Studio Code because maybe I have developers that are running on Mac, they're running on Linux, um, they're running on Windows. Visual Studio Code, I know it's hard to see, um, but basically it's our uh, code editor that's completely open source and multi-platform. So from Visual Studio Code, we do have support for Docker built in as well, um, just adding a plugin. And what I've done basically in my environment to show you what the environment looks like, I have a GitHub repo that I'm using as my source repository. In there, I have uh, my Docker files to build my images for an application that I built. I'm gonna show you the application in a minute. And I just go ahead, and I just went ahead and I opened that folder that I've uh, cloned locally to my laptop and I'm able to actually look at the, the files, the, the Docker files. This can be any, it doesn't have to be GitHub, it can be GitLab, it can be any source repository that you have access to. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and modify this a little bit. So I'm gonna give this, um, I'm gonna give this a three instead of uh, on replicas. And I'm gonna go ahead and save that file. You'll notice as soon as I save that file, my GitHub tells me I have a new change. So I have to commit the change to my GitHub so I'm gonna go ahead and say commit change. I'm say add replicas. And I'll commit the change. Now when I, when I go ahead and do a push, before I do a push, what I've done is I've used Visual Studio Team Services. So another one of our tool sets, Visual Studio, most of you know it. All of you think probably it's good for just .NET development. Well that's not the case. Uh, Visual Studio Team Services and Team Foundation Server, it's a full CI CD pipeline tooling that you can use for all of your development, Java, open source, and now including Docker. So I've built a VSTS pipeline that's a build pipeline and a release pipeline. So basically I have Docker commands now built in to my VSTS and my Team, my team Foundation Services. So I, now I can go ahead and do my builds and I can do my pushes uh, of my images up to a registry. It can be a hosted registry, or it can be a registry that, that you self-deploy on your Swarm cluster. And I can go ahead and deploy the entire cluster, and I can use CI, CI so I can, as soon as I make a change in GitHub, I've tied my VSTS to GitHub. As soon as I make that change, this will automatically start a build process. So let me show So if we're using VSTS, does that mean we have to host our source control in VSTS? No, it can be any source control. Um, we do on-prem source controls, uh, GitLab, Git, uh, doesn't really matter. So in this case, we're just using VSTS as our build process and- Correct. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna do this sync real quick. You see I changed it from three to one. Uh, I'm sorry, from, um, uh, from three to one. I'm gonna do a sync to add the replicas. Once the sync registers in GitHub, um, my build will kick off. So we'll see that happen over here. Let me go back to this. Let me just go to my build definitions. And while he's going to his build yeah. definitions, one thing I want to interject, he was in VS Code, that editor you saw, VS Code. If anyone has uh, looked at the annual report that GitHub comes out with once a year, that is an open source project that's actually in the top 10 right now of all open source projects, and by the way, the number one contributor to open source on GitHub right now is Microsoft. is Microsoft. Do not take my word for it. Please go to the annual GitHub report that came out a few months and look it up for yourselves. Don't take my word for it, take GitHub's word for it. Just to, as an illustration, an illustration, how much the landscape has changed at Microsoft in the last 10 years, particularly with respect to open source. So my build is building, you see it's running right now, and it's actually using something called the hosted Linux agent. So instead of having to have a build server or a build machine, we're actually hosting the build agent in the cloud for you. And it's actually running the whole entire build off of a Linux VM that we run in the cloud. Believe it or not, it's actually a container. So um, we're building out this whole entire, uh, so I'm doing all my builds and all my pushes directly from this, and then it's gonna automatically trigger a CD. It's gonna trigger a release to then send that compose file directly to my swarm cluster and run the compose file. So what should happen, I did this ahead of time because it will take a little bit well, as I build new images and I pull down all my code and it starts compiling all the .NET code. So I pre-did this. So when all of you, this is the first time a, a talker has actually asked, a speaker has asked you all to pull out your phone. But I want you to pull out your phones and I want you to go to uh, an IP address. And basically this is the IP address of uh, my service I just exposed, 52.227. 172.207.174.204. 52.227.174.204. The reason I ask you that is because I'm actually taking um, 
uh, end node data, so I'm, I'm saving that in PostgreSQL, so I can't have anyone do more than one vote. You only count one person or one machine or one session counts as one vote. Um, so this is basically just a simple voting app, uh, and I have a results page, and I'll pull it up. Again, it's 52, 227, 174, 204. I hope you vote for cats, or I mean for dogs. I like dogs, <laughs> not cats. No, I like cats too. So we got some votes coming in. So what this architecture is, believe it or not, it's um, a front-end voting tool made in Node.js. I have a, a results tool built in Python. I have a Redis cache server that's bringing in the cache of all the votes. It's writing it to a PostgreSQL server that's taking all of that data and then um, storing it for, for so we, don't, we make sure that only one vote counts. And um, a worker node that's running in .NET. Um, so that's I think, complete I think worker node. Just like I said, we shouldn't take my word for it. I think we should make him prove it too. Yeah. So let's go back over to VS Code and just have him show right. a couple lines of code of the node, the, the C Sharp just so we can prove it to you that we have these three apps and all these different languages. So great, so I have uh, a, result, a, a result processed, right? So actually let me pull up this so I can show you what that all looks like at a higher level. Let me pull up the, uh, the diagram. So um, as you can see, I have a, a voting app, results app, Redis DB, and then worker. The voting and the result were built by Docker files, and then we have a worker that was also built by a Docker file. The Redis and the DB were just pulled down straight from Docker Hub uh, immediately, so I didn't, I didn't have to use any custom images for that. So if I look at my VS Code, basically I have a folder here for my result, and my result Docker file, basically it's very simple. Pull, pull from the node, uh, 5.11.0 slim, I'm writing, um, using an app as my working directory. I'm gonna do a couple of NPM installs and configure my package and then expose a certain port and then go ahead and run the command to initiate the service, which is command server.js. So this is my node.js, that's the results file. So that page that you were looking at when the votes were being tallied, right? Um, when I look at the, my voting app, my voting app, my Docker file there, that's built from a Python Alpine. Again, it's really hard to see here, at least maybe for me. Um, can you expand it for me? You gotta change it to uh, light beam real yeah, quick. light beam. There you go. That's better. Yeah. So again, um, I'm running basically uh, the same kind of Docker, typical Docker file. Nothing different there. Doing a pip install for some Python uh, the pieces and the requirements, and went ahead and started the process from there. My worker app is pure.net, and this is under my source folder. So here. What I actually have is a project JSON file that dictates all of the dependencies that are gonna be built at compile time. And then my actual program CS, which is the actual connection to the PostgreSQL and the Redis database, and then bring all that information into the database. And that's actually .NET Core. Yes. Which is an important distinction because .NET Core can be deployed natively to Linux. We don't have to have Windows like we do with the full-blown .NET framework. .NET Core is truly cross-platform. Yeah, so when I write with .NET Core, I can put it on any platform I want. So I can run on a Linux container, I can run on a Windows container. Um, believe it or not, it runs on ARM. Uh, so it, it, we can run it pretty much anywhere, uh, lightweight. Um, if you do have a requirement for the full .NET, um, we do have images in the Docker Hub library that, full, that support the full .NET libraries as well. Um, and they run server core instead of nano server or things like that. So you have the option of running both. Um, you're not limited by that. Uh, so basically, this just runs a DLL that runs uh, uh, behind the scenes. And because uh, my compose file, um, once I put all of these together, where's my swarm mode? Uh, there you go. When I look at my compose file, I basically deploy these to either one of two networks, a front tier or a back tier network. Again, I'm using swarm overlays. And then I, I went ahead and just put each of my services and deployed. You'll notice I'm using variables. This is so that I can use my one swarm file, my one compose file, and I can build variables into my CI CD pipeline and change those at deployment time. So I can easily go from dev to test to production by just changing variables, and I don't have to rewrite my code. My code will work the same because I'm using variables that can be replaced by VSTS. Okay? Um, so this is all uh, Compose version three, if you haven't seen it. If you want to deploy to Docker Stacks, you have to uh, de use uh, Compose version three. And um, I went ahead and just de declared my services, uh, declared my volume, declared my networks. And when I go now to my, my cluster, I can say uh, Docker, Docker Stack LS. 
So I'll have this cat dog service that is running. Um, I can do uh, Docker uh, stack inspect cat dog. Oh, oh, sorry. It's Docker service inspect. And then we'll, we'll look at the worker. Uh, I believe it's cat dog. Oops, cat dog underscore vote. There you go. So this is my um, worker service. And it tells you the networks it was deployed to, uh, when it was started. As you can see, it, it was uh, the uptime, the ports that I exposed. Uh, and I, I made an ingress port, a VIP, for port 80. And um, there's my parallelism. So I, in terms of updating, if I decide to do a push and update, it will dictate how it updates those and how many keep, needs to keep online, how many replicas I have. And um, there's my container spec and any labels that I may have uh, assigned to it as well. So as you can see, quickly deployed. Uh, so, so far, everything's running in Azure. I used Microsoft VSTS to push. I'm using Docker for Windows to do all of my development uh, before I send over to my production swarm cluster running in Azure government. Um, but it's all running on Linux right now. So what I wanted to show you was this uh, as a leaving scenario. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do Docker swarm Join token worker. So this is giving me my worker, my, this is giving me my, um, what command I have to run on any node that I want to make a worker for my swarm. And we pass it this token. So earlier in the morning, we were talking about the security model. This is how we verify that all of the nodes that go into the swarm all have TLS certificates verified and created. And as we're passing this token, so you don't have to do all this management stuff to do that, just one pass, very easy. So I'm gonna take this command, which is a Linux command. I have to do a little bit of windowizing it, uh, but I'm gonna log into, uh, we log into, a Windows Server 2016 host. Now this uh, Windows Server was just updated with all the latest KBs. Uh, we just released the KB uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, uh, that offered the network overlay mode for swarm mode, right? So uh, make sure that if you're trying this at home, um, uh, make sure you've done all your Windows updates on the Windows Server to have the latest feature set on that. So basically, uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and run that Docker swarm join, add the token in to be a worker, the IP address and the port of the master, and now this Windows server is now a member of the swarm. Uh, now I have a hybrid cluster. And I could go ahead and start creating node labels and say node OS equals Windows, node OS equals Linux. And I could put placement constraints on my compose file to say I want to deploy certain services. What you saw there was it, it just installed the network overlay. So I dropped the RDP connection for a second uh, while it did the re-network configuration and then it brought it back up again. So that's why it flickered like that, uh, expected. Uh, but now if I go to my swarm and I do docker node ls, I'm gonna have to put a watch on that. Oh, there it is, win agent zero. So now I have my Windows agent running in the swarm and I have a full hybrid cluster going, um, all running in Windows. So that's the kind of demo, I just wanna show you this quick demo of we can actually do end-to-end -end build from development platform on your desktop all the way to production in an Azure cloud environment very quick and very easily um, without having to do too much, um, you know, having to worry about infrastructure and how do I lay these out and how do I lay my network out. It's all done for you very quickly and very easily. Uh, I do wanna show you a little bit of something coming to the future at Microsoft, um, which is um, what we call our Azure Container Service. Um, this is basically meant more for dev test type scenarios where we want customers to, again, very quickly and easily establish a container orchestration system in our Azure platform, but getting to be fully managed. Um, so what we're doing today is we're working with uh, all three of the, um, bit, uh, what we consider the bigger open source uh, uh, orchestrators um, out there. And what we do is we give you this capability of deploying one of these orchestrators um, uh, to the cloud in a you can basically just a, a template that you build out. Uh, now I will tell you, these are all open source versions 
of these orchestrators. So even with Docker, it's the open source version or Docker CE. So uh, when we talk to customers like yourselves and big commercial enterprises that need production level data, we always obviously gear you towards uh, Docker data center, Docker enterprise in this case, um, and to make sure that you have the, the full level support that you're looking for. Um, but we want to basically be able to streamline this build out and give you an API plugin of a managed service. So at some point in the future, we're hoping to release this into government, um, even to the point where we're actually releasing uh, OS and orchestrator upgrades uh, in, a, in an organized fashion or in a, in a fashion directly from the portal. Uh, so that's kind of where the future of uh, containers is coming with Microsoft in terms of a Microsoft offering as well as supporting all of our partners uh, and specifically Docker in their uh, in deploying their infrastructure and their in their ecosystem into our cloud. So, and, and one thing I want to just add, I think some, Eddie mentioned this earlier, and I think it's important to emphasize that uh, when he showed you the portal originally, and it had all of the resources that were provisioned uh, via that template. When you when we provision that template for the first time, how long would you say it takes to run? Is it like 15, 20 minutes? Yeah, 15 minutes the most. All right, 15 yeah. minutes. You could go out and provision a bunch of VMs, and you could manually install all this yourself, and you can certainly do that. And we, if you want to do that on our VMs, you're happy to do it. But it's the networking, all the VMs, the swarm, the installation of the software. You can do that, or you can just take 15 minutes, click a few buttons, and boom. The, yeah. the environment that you just saw him use for that demo, just go get a cup of coffee, come back 15 minutes. The entire environment, your networking is configured. Everything is there for you just in 15 minutes. So I think sometimes people, oh, okay, he must have, you know, we obviously are not going to take 15 minutes to deploy it in the demo, but sometimes I think it, 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 people miss it because, oh, they must have done all that installation a few days beforehand. Yes, that's true, but when that happened, 15 minutes. Yeah, so just to show you, because we got about five minutes left, I do want to open it to any questions if anyone has any questions, but I do want to show you this. Uh, this is how easy it is. Uh, I went to the Azure, I went to my Azure portal. I'm in Gov portal. I typed in Docker uh, on the marketplace. So when I click on this little plus symbol, it gives me a search bar. I just typed in Docker. And, and the I got publisher back. of this template is? Docker. Docker. <laughs> Not Microsoft. We didn't right. do it. Exactly. Uh, Docker. So uh, when I click on Docker for enterprise, it comes up, gives me, you know, the legal mumbo jumbo that everyone has to uh, do nowadays, in, uh, but gives you information. But it's, uh, I think, three panes of a wizard that's going to ask you some serious some questions. Give me the name of the cluster, the location of the cluster. Um, service principle is important. Service principle for us is like a service account in Azure Active Directory. So because what happens is we, we work so closely with Docker, they want to know our API. So the future is you should be able to do from Docker commands that automatically affect the Azure infrastructure. So that means if I expose a service with an ingress controller, that means I want it exposed publicly. So I want it to automatically build an Azure load balancer with the right ports exposed. If I want to scale something, I want it to automatically build the infrastructure. So I want it to call the Azure scale command. So the service account principle is the account that's being used to do that. Um, and then an SSH key to, to key in what subscription I want to use, a resource group, and then location. Those are the six regions that, um, that uh, Steve showed earlier, which location in Gov anyway, where you want to put this swarm, right? Um, once I fill that in, the next thing is basically configuring the cluster. Um, I, it's, and that's really just how many masters do I want, how many agents do I want, and then what's the name of the swarm cluster, um, and then you're done. <laughs> and then you, you hit next and you go. Uh, that's it. So it's actually two panes and an acceptance. Uh, and once you accept it, we go out and we build everything in parallel. So if you say, I want 100 agents, I want 15 masters, all 100 agents are actually being built in parallel, and all 15 masters are being built in parallel. So however long it takes us to build one VM is as long as it takes us to build 100 VMs, because they're all being built out by the fabric in parallel. Right? Um, so in about 15 minutes, you have a fully um, built cluster with all the ports open, all the networking, all the tubing, all of the keys taken care of. Everything is done for you. You don't have to worry about putting all that plumbing together yourself. So with that, uh, two minutes, question? No? We, if you guys do have other questions you think of, we have a, a, a booth outside for Azure Government. Additionally, I just want to mention that on June 7th and 8th, we have a Azure Government Hackfest uh, event, two-day event, it's oh, free. Yes. And uh, that's a great opportunity to learn more about Azure Government. Uh, so we have flyers uh, out, at, uh, out of the booth if you want to talk to us and get more information about it. Oh, dogs, all right, there we go. Dogs won, yeah. <laughs> 